Yes. Matthew chapter 12. That's how I started. Here's my guess. You all have questions that I will not answer in tonight's lecture. That's my guess. Uh, I will not get to everything. And I will answer questions that you don't even have. I guarantee it. So I apologize ahead of time, but that's just the nature of where we are in chapter 12. It's a big chapter. There's a lot to cover. And uh, knowing that we have so much to cover in chapter 12 of Matthew, I'd like you to turn back to Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> because Matthew chapter 12 is uh, beginning, it's all about the Sabbath. In fact, we ended chapter 11 all about rest. Do you remember that? Jesus inviting us to his easy yoke, inviting us to, if we are weary and heavy laden, to come to him and he will give us rest. It's this concept of godly rest that I'm going to take the first five to 20 minutes to talk about. I intend for it to be five, but if my track record proves anything, it may end up being 20. But here we go. Genesis chapter one. The reason I'm spending time on this is because I think we as a culture have misunderstood what godly rest is. Um, and as we go back to this story in Genesis, I'm going to point out a few things and I'm going to throw out a few concepts to you to consider. And then I'm going to invite you to bring those concepts with you into our study of Matthew 12 as we conclude this evening to see if that brings a little more clarity to what it is that Jesus, this discussion that Jesus is having back and forth with the Pharisees. So as I presented last week, just briefly, um, Godly rest in ancient times had to do with when a god set up function and order within the cosmos, built a temple, inhabited that temple, and ruled the creation from that temple. This is not just a biblical story, version of the story. We find this, these elements in other creation stories that are extra biblical as well. And it's into that that Genesis 1 was written and explained that way, okay? Now, I'm not saying that Genesis 1 is a false account. In fact, I'm saying just the opposite. It is a true account, but it was using verbiage that the people of the day understood when the Genesis account explains that there was rest or there was a Sabbath on day seven. They understood that to mean that the God had come, he had set up a functioning and ordered creation, and now he was ruling that creation from his temple, which was Eden in Genesis chapter one. Okay, so rest then is a concept that's full of activity, physical activity. Does that make sense? There was tending of the garden, correct? There was uh, being fruitful and multiplying. There was a lot of activity going on, but they were at rest. And it's not until sin enters the picture and chaos is reintroduced to the situation that penalties are given out and work begins. The creation begins to attempt work. Does that make sense? So let's just go back. I invite you back to Genesis chapter three. We're gonna make this very quick. So if you're not familiar with Genesis account of creation, you're going to want to spend some more time because I'm not going to do it justice in that sense. But there was function and order. Everything was functioning properly. And then everything started to fall apart. Sin entered the picture and chaos was reintroduced back into the godly order of things. Even before, if you look at Genesis 3, 7, even before they're kicked out of the garden, there's work going on. What is the work? They begin to sew fig leaves together and cover themselves. This is work that wasn't originally intended for the creation to do. Does that make sense? It's not until sin entered that they felt their nakedness and felt the need to cover. So when they began to cover themselves, this is an attempt by creation to fix the chaos and get it back in order but the creation is unable to create function and order. Whose job is that? 
this is an important question, so I don't want to go too fast. Whose job is it, if it's not the creation's job to, to do function and order and make it established, whose job is it? It's very God himself, okay? The one that we read about in the first two chapters and that process that happened. So what else? They're hiding from God. This is work. Why? Because it's not the way they originally intended to function. Right? Were this, they embarrassed? This is the chaos. This is, yes. So they have stepped outside of the function and order that God gave them, the way they were supposed to live, and now they're covering themselves and they're hiding from God, and those two things are work. And then the penalties are handed out, 316. What are the penalties? Very quickly, they're removed from the place of rest. They're kicked out of Eden, right? And women are given pain in childbirth. What do we call childbirth, women? It's labor. labor. Isn't that interesting? It's work, right? And in fact, if you go back into the, um, the Hebrew behind this, this word pain here, is the exact same word um, described to uh, the condition that's given to Adam in his work in, on the land. We translate it as toil, but it's the exact same Hebrew word. Woman, you will have pain. Man, you will have pain. Women will have chain. We translate it childbirth, but it's actually the concept of uh, conceiving and finding out that you're pregnant. You will have pain in that, women. We like to associate it with the act of giving birth. That makes sense, right? Lots of pain, I hear, in that process. Oh, yes. Witnessed it three times. First time I was unaware because I was being born. <laughs> but the other two times, definitely pain involved, right? But if that's not what the text is saying, if the text is saying you will have pain or sorrow when you find out you are pregnant, where does that come from? I just proposed to you that the pain that women feel when they find out they are with child and have life is the ultimate conclusion that you have to come to what's going to happen with that child. Well, we'll give birth, that'll be exciting. Yes. We'll raise that child, that's always fun. We'll kick them out of the house eventually. <laughs> That's great. But in the back of your head, when you conceive, you know what is the end result. Yeah. It's death. It's chaos. And there's pain in that. That is work to try and figure that out. And you're going to want to try and solve that yourself. But is it your business? It's not. Men. Um, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, pain, same work. In pain, you will work the ground in need of it. Why is this painful and sorrowful? It's not just because it's hard work. I get that. Kind of like the women giving labor. I get that. But it's really painful. Why? What was the condition before? You didn't have to do that. It just the land produced. All you did is you went and picked and ate. And now it's a sorrowful condition that we find ourselves in. It's a condition of work. These are physical examples of what's going on spiritually for us as well. Women, you will have sorrow when you find out you're pregnant and give birth. Men, your work is sorrowful work as well. And let that be reflective of your spiritual condition. What we see in physicality know that that is also a clear picture of what's going on spiritually, okay? So, definition of work. It's important to note that this work, this work of toiling, this sorrowful pain, it's not work because people are engaged in physical activity. That's the wrong definition. This is how we misunderstand it in our culture. It's work because it's not the original intent of the creation. That's why it's work, by definition. And if you flip that up on its hind end, you have the definition of rest. So by definition, rest then is functioning the way you were intended to function. Full of activity. 
We like to think it's rest is laying in a hammock. And that is one definition. But really, our rest is when we function the way we were intended to function, the way we were created to function. And we, when we step outside of that, like Adam and Eve did, it becomes work and toil. And it's a reminder that chaos has been invited into this picture and that we need to trust the Creator Himself to restore order in our lives and in our world. Okay? Now, that's the backdrop. It's into that setting, that understanding of what rest is that we come into chapter 12. And so let's just dive in. We're going to go rather quickly. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Okay? So we've got the Sabbath, which is a commandment in the Old Testament to not do work one day in seven. And I'll talk about the purpose of that commandment in a little bit, but this is happening on that day. It's a reflection of back to Eden, right? It's a reminder that we're not functioning in creation the way we were originally intended. Every week we have this reminder. <clears throat> Jesus is traveling. There's a provision in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 24 and 25. It's easy to remember, 23, 24, and 25 in Deuteronomy. It gives provision to all of Israel for travelers. If you're traveling and you become hungry, no matter where you are, you can stop and either in a vineyard or in a field that has uh, some crop, and you're welcome to pick that and eat it to your belly's content. But you cannot take a sickle and harvest. Does that make sense? You're not being invited to harvest somebody else's crop. But as a traveler, everyone in Israel, this is a, this is a law of generosity. Do you see that? Because if I plant my field, I don't want you guys just stopping by and <laughs> snacking. But it's a built-in law of generosity that people are taught. If you live in Israel, here's a clear picture of God's graciousness, right? Yeah, as we travel through life, uh, we are afforded the same generosity. So this is what's going on. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. Uh, they are picking grain, and the Pharisees want to pick a fight. So they come up and they say in verse 2, Look, your disciples, evidently Jesus wasn't doing this, but his disciples were. Your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, because of Deuteronomy chapter 23, we know that what they're doing is lawful. The question then becomes, the, the point that the Pharisees are trying to make is, you're doing something lawful, but you're doing it on the Sabbath. That's what makes it unlawful, okay? So that's what the Pharisees are coming in, and that's what the discussion is gonna be about. And then Jesus goes into a couple different examples from the Old Testament. And I know you looked at it as a part of your, um, uh, as a part of your lesson. And they're kind of confusing examples if you try and follow the logic. So I'm going to try and piece this meal, piecemeal it together for you. But before we get to the examples, I want to figure out where we're going to end up in this argument. Okay, Jesus is going to give two examples, and at the end of those examples, He's going to come to two conclusions. And they are found in verse 6. But I say to you, Jesus, to the Pharisees, I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. That is a final conclusion coming out of the two examples we're going to share. And then in verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And we'll talk about what that means. Two conclusions is where we're headed. It's about the temple and it's about the Sabbath. Okay? So, knowing that, what does he share? He says, Have you not read how David became hungry? He and his companions ate the bread of the present temple. Uh, this is a story out of 1 Samuel 21, where David is traveling with his companions. Uh, they are hungry and they go to the temple. The priest, the high priest, gives them. Uh, the bread of the presence, which was designated only for whom to eat? The priests only, okay? And Jesus brings this point up. In essence, he's saying, you're trying to convict us for something 
but David did something, you're trying to convict us for something that in Deuteronomy 23 is clearly said it's okay to do, but David clearly did something that was not okay to do, and you hold him in high regard. Why is it that you're trying to bring us down and you still are willing to lift him up? So that's part of the argument, okay? And then he goes on in verse five. Notice how he starts these two arguments. Have you not, have you not read? Now what's the likelihood that the Pharisees haven't read this? Zero, right? I mean, they have doctorates in this type of stuff. So is this, is this a challenge? How would this have been received? Probably not well. Have you not read, <coughs> verse five, in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? What are Jesus's two examples? One is about David going to the temple and eating bread. The other is about the work a priest does in the temple. And one seems to have something to do with the Sabbath, the priests. The other one seemingly doesn't have anything to do with the Sabbath, except if you go back in the Old Testament, the day of the week that the 12 loaves of bread that David ate are switched out and available to eat. Do you know what day of the week that is? It's on the Sabbath. So it's not explicitly written in, but kind of, kind of behind the scenes, you're to understand that it's likely David showed up on the Sabbath. It's the day that the new bread was being brought and put on the table of showbread. The old bread was now available, and Jesus himself says he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread. Now, that's kind of a background thing. And again, it's not there, but it's kind of between the lines. We can try and figure out the logic of where Jesus was going and how he tried to tie this into what his disciples were doing. Not at the temple, but in a grain field. We can try and, and that's what your commentaries try to do, but I'm gonna propose something to you that's a little bit different. At the time in 1 Samuel that David does this, do we know his, did any of you do any research and look as to what was going on in David's life at this time? David ends up being king, right? But at this time, he is not the king on the throne. He is the anointed fugitive running from Saul, who is still the king in power, but whose anointing had been removed. Saul's anointing is removed. David's anointing is given when David is very little. And then for a long period of time, Saul remains on the throne in power, but without God's anointing. And David, this boy that grows up into a man, is God's anointed one. He is the king, a parent, but not yet on his throne. You understand that? And it's that David who has been anointed, who is on the run and being persecuted by the people who are currently in power that shows up at the temple and requests this bread. And as the king to be, he is also functioning in a way, typologically, by eating the bread, he is also functioning as a priest. Well, what's the problem with that? That's the very thing that Saul did to have his anointing removed. He tried to function as king and offer a sacrifice as priest. So here's what you've got. You've got a scenario that Jesus brings up, a story that brings us, Jesus brings up about one that had been anointed by God, that had not yet taken his throne, that was being persecuted by the people currently in power that God's anointing had been taken away from. Does this sound familiar at all? Whose story is this? It's Jesus' story. Jesus is one like David in this sense. He is the one that has been anointed. He is God's chosen one. And he is the one currently being persecuted by those in power in Israel that don't have God's anointing. And what is, God, what is Jesus' argument? His argument is one greater than the temple is here. 
Who is he talking about when he says that? Himself. And when he says one greater than the temple is here, he is saying not just the temple building, but the ministry of the temple, which includes the ministry of the priestly tribe, including the high priest. He is saying that one greater than the entirety of the temple is here. All the ministry of the temple that the temple provides has arrived. And in the scenario of David and David's companions that go to the temple, who's David? Jesus. Who are the companions of David? The disciples out in the grain field, right? What bread are they eating? Not the consecrated bread from the table of presents, but grain in the field. But Jesus says, one greater than the temple is here. What he's claiming is that scenario is very similar because I am, a, I am a temple in and of myself. We see that language from Jesus. Wherever I am, the temple is operating. Remember our definition of godly rest? Where does it happen from? It happens from a temple. Okay? Jesus is telling the Pharisees your definition of what work is you have made this up. You've made this burden, you've given this burden to these people, and it's not a biblical burden. He's not arguing against the law of the Old Testament. He's arguing against the Pharisees' definition and interpretation of that law. Okay? Have you not read in the law the Sabbath priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? Jesus is saying, I am the new high priest. I am fulfilling the role of the temple ministry. That was a shadow, all shadows that point to my ministry and where I am, those things are working. I am able to do these things much like in the Old Testament, sometimes things were broken or not done exactly right. That is my, and where is the argument going? Not just I am one greater than the temple, but I am Lord of the Sabbath. Well, if you're Lord of something, what do you get to do with it? You get to define how it operates. And who was trying to define how it operates? The creation. And whose job is it? To get the creation back to godly rest. It's the creators, right? This is a big theological argument that Jesus is having. It continues down into this I am Lord of the Sabbath idea because what does he do next? He encounters a man with a withered hand, right? A withered hand. Now, if you have a withered hand, is it functioning the way it was intended to function? No, it's not. Hands were intended to grab things and do activity and work. And... But if you have a withered hand, what are you not able to do? You're not able to function the way you were intended. This is becoming a, a a picture of our condition spiritually, right? And what does Jesus do? Notice what it says in verse 13. And he said to man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And then it says in my version, and it was restored to normal, right? It was restored to health is the literal translation. Jesus' ministry as our king as our high priest, the ministry of the temple is to restore creation back to its original health, the function that it originally had before sin entered the picture. It does that not just for the creation wide, but it does it for each individual within that creation. That is your invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to examine what it is that's not functioning in your life give that over to God himself, the one that can correct, correct that, and to forget trying to fix it on your own, because that's not your job and you're incapable of doing that. Okay? Um, as we go down, um, and I'm gonna skip over that and come back to it in just a minute. 
Entering the strong man's house. Some of you had questions about this. Um, what is this? So we have some demon possession, and we've got some um, Jesus casting out demons, and then the Pharisees try and challenge him and say he's working for the other side, and he's really, uh, he enters into this. Uh, I'm not going to get into the argument of that, but down at the end, he does have this interesting conclusion, verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then, if that is the truth, and we know it's the truth, his conclusion is, the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is a plural you. Speaking of who? Ultimately, the kingdom of God has come upon all of creation, ultimately, but who is he talking to here and then? He's, he's talking to these Pharisees that are challenging by what authority are you, are you working on the devil's side or are you working on God's side and we think you're working for the devil. And he says, if I'm working by the Spirit of God, that means the kingdom of God has come upon you Pharisees, you unbelieving Pharisees. How do I know that? Because of where we're kind of going in the argument a little bit later on. And then he says this kind of weird thing. Or how can anyone enter a strong man's house, carry off his property, unless he first binds the strong man? I think we may have talked about this earlier in uh, our Matthew study. And then he will plunder his house. This strong man, do we know who this strong man is? Yeah, it's going to be Satan. It's the kind of the ruler of the world, the, the ruler of the chaos of this world. And he says, I can't come in and start plundering the possession of the strong man, this man who's demon possessed. I can't start plundering that from him unless the strong man himself has been bound, right? The power of him, which I would tend to go back to the temptation in the wilderness. This is prior to the cross, and obviously the cross is, is the ultimate binding, right? It's the answer to death. But here in Jesus' ministry, I would go back to the temptation in the wilderness where, where Jesus was tempted directly by Satan and answered correctly every single time in a way that nobody else prior to him could or had done. And that was the binding of the strong man. And here, Jesus says, once he is bound, then we can go and plunder his house, the actual people in that um, evil generation that he had raised up. And we have evil and adulterous generation mentioned down in verse 39. We talked about that in the last couple weeks as well. We pray for a sign. No sign will be given it except what? Jonah the prophet. What's the sign of Jonah the prophet? It's a little more complex than I think you might originally think. It's definitely three days and three nights the experience Jonah had in the belly of the great sea monster, right? The big fish. It's definitely that because that relates to Jesus' time in the grave and his resurrection out of the grave. Definitely part of that. But what else about Jonah is a sign to that generation? Because it's not just that Jesus will come out of the grave that will convince this generation that they are being condemned. Jonah, not totally unique to himself, but one of just a handful of Old Testament prophets, Jonah's ministry was to whom? Where did he go? Nineveh. Or not go first and then when? It was Nineveh. Are, is Nineveh within the nation of Israel? No. These are Gentile people. And so really the sign of Jonah is this miraculous three-day event and a seemingly coming back from the dead out of the belly of the fish but then subsequent to that the message of God being taken to the Gentiles and what was their response they repented right that is the sign of Jonah that is the complete sign of Jonah if we stop just at Jesus coming out of the grave that is an incomplete picture of what Jonah's ministry was saying to this generation you will see some incredible stuff on the third day from me and in that way I'm like Jonah 
but really your sign, the completion of that sign, is the fact that this message that has been Israel's, you've hoarded it like a possession, that message will go to the Gentiles and they will accept it and come into a saving faith before you do. That's the sign of Jonah. And we see that play out, not just in the remainder of the gospel, but throughout the book of Acts, right? Okay. Let's try and finish this. <laughs> something greater than is here. <clears throat> we saw something greater than in the beginning of this chapter. What was it? Something greater than the, the temple is here. Okay, and we said that's not just the temple, but it's really the ministry of the priestly tribe in that temple, the high priest. Something greater than the high priest is here. Here, in the last part of this chapter, what we have is two more something greater than, and it's something greater than Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, we've already talked about that. And something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon was a king. Not just any king, we'll talk about what makes him distinguishable. So of these three, you've got priests, something greater than the temple represented. You've got prophets, and you've got kings. These are the three positions in the Old Testament under the law that were anointed by God. People chosen by God, anointed with oil as a symbol of their anointing of the Holy Spirit, to rule God's people. The priests to rule from the temple, the king from the palace, and the prophets to go in amongst the people and define what God's word is. And so Jesus in this chapter, Matthew's presentation of Jesus' words in this chapter, he's combined them to have Jesus saying to us, to the original readers and then ultimately to us, Jesus is saying, my ministry is the fulfillment of all the priests, of all the kings and of all the prophets in the Old Testament, all those people anointed by God to come and bring God's kingdom to earth, I am the fulfillment of all of it. Those are big words. That's a big concept. And we may not pick up on the enormity of that statement because we don't live in this kingdom. We have a presidency that rotates every four or eight years. We've got lots of turnover. We don't have the same concept. But when Jesus said this, it was dramatic. And Jesus is saying that those shadowy positions, those positions that pointed to his ministry, are now helping you understand what I'm here to do. I'm here to fulfill the ministry of the temple. I'm here to be your king. And I'm here to speak the very words of God to you and correctly interpret what they mean. Unlike your current leadership. I'm like David on the run. I'm like, I'm one greater than Solomon. Solomon's distinction was what? He was very wise, right? Sometimes. What other distinctions did Solomon have? He was very rich. Yeah. He increase the borders of the kingdom beyond anybody else's borders. But what is the one thing, if you were a really good Jew, you would say to Saul, you would point to Solomon and say, he was the king that gave us the temple. I'm not just, my ministry is not just the fulfillment of the temple, but it's, I'm one greater than the man that built the temple. And what is Jesus trying to do in his ministry? He's building a new temple. He is a new Solomon, but he's one better than Solomon because he doesn't have any of the downsides. None of the faults of Solomon. Solomon had great wisdom, but he wasn't very wise at times, right? Yeah. Okay, how do I know this? So let's take a look back up at uh, 1218, a, a quote of an Old Testament passage here. And it's out of Isaiah. This, my servant whom I have chosen. Oh, did I not get there? Oh, sound called. My servant whom I have chosen. Two lines later, I will put my spirit upon him. 
This is anointing language. And God is saying, Jesus, you are the servant that I have chosen. Much like in the Old Testament, I chose all those other um, positions. And I've chosen you to fulfill all those. Let's end with this, uh, Matthew 12, 43. Unclean spirits going out of a man, passing through waterless places, seeking rest. Interesting use of rest there. Then it says, I'm going to return to my house from which I came. And he finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Who puts things in order? Very God himself puts things in order, okay, from a rest standpoint. And so what, who is this man? This man is Israel, the people. Who is the, where's the house? What is the house that's been swept? It's, it's the nation of Israel. The, the people there have been, the demons have been kicked out. The house has been put in order during Jesus' ministry. But Jesus is going to leave. And what happens when Jesus leaves? The demons that have been kicked out and the house that have been put in order, those demons come back more so than they were before. And they cause more, wreak more havoc and cause more disorder than they were before. Now, is this the ultimate end of the world? No, this, I mean, what does he say? This is the way it will be, also be with this evil generation. Jesus is explaining the outcome of his ministry in Israel at that time. He is coming in, he is kicking out demons, he's making them wander around because they don't have a person to be into, be attached to. He is putting things in order, but he will eventually go, and when that happens, the condition of Israel is going to get worse than it was before and will eventually lead to their downfall, their judgment by God. And we see that happen in AD 70 when the Roman comes in. Romans uh, are beckoned by God to come in and pass judgment on this. And that temple is destroyed and not one stone is left upon another. Jesus even talks about it. We'll get there in the letter for that man. All right? I didn't get to everything. And I went way over. Thanks for sticking with me. Let's end in prayer, and uh, you can uh, write me emails and tell me how I messed up. <laughs> Dear God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for, um, just thanks for this reminder of what rest is. And that rest is completely dependent upon you. Restoring function and order back into our lives. And God, uh, to the extent that some of us may even find ourselves right now in a situation where chaos is reigning in our life, and it can do it in so many different ways, in relationships and family and finances, and we are trying to fix it on our own. God, let this, let this scripture just be a reminder to us tonight that we need to hand that back to you because that is your job. And that we need to enter into a relationship where we're sharing your yoke. And then we let you do the work that you are intended to do. And that through that, the function and order that we were created for will be restored to us. God, that is really what we seek as a creation. It's what we seek as a church family. It's what we seek as an individual. So God, we just invite you to bring that function and order back to our lives. And I don't even know what that looks like right now. But I know where the chaos is. So we invite you. Thank you for your ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.